joining us this evening. Welcome back to Waterbury. It's and great. Krishna. <laughs> it's been, I think, a couple of years, I think, since the last yeah. time you were here. Yeah, I was here. Um, it was Lila just about and Lila and Theron, yep. yes. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah, well, welcome yep. back. Yeah, well, thank you. It's good to be here. And thank you all for coming out. And um, I would, and, and thank you. You're welcome. I just, yeah, can interrupt. sure. We actually um, wanted to do a little bit of a different, um, a little bit of a different format for this evening, too. We're going to talk about um, Bill's most recent book, but also as someone who has published now, this is the eighth book. Eight, yeah. Eighth book um, and author of eight books. Um, we wanted to, we thought it might be an interesting thing also to share his experiences and advice. And answer recommendations, questions. questions yeah. And, so you want to write a book and how you get that. Absolutely. So we thought that might be a really kind of a fun thing to do on a, Sounds great. On a April evening. Well, <laughs> so thank you. With no further ado, <coughs> also I did just want to... Um, Welcome, uh, Orca. You're Orca, yes. And um, thank you. And just, uh, they will be filming. So I guess if anybody has any questions or concerns, mm -hmm. let you know. Sure. But otherwise, these guys are filming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for turning out. Um, I keep hearing that spring is coming. <laughs> um, just a, a tiny bit of background. I have lived in Vermont since 1947, but in all honesty, I was born in New York City. Uh, <coughs> my, my father died before I was born in World War II, and my mother, after I was born, um, stayed in New York as long as she could stand it, and she couldn't stand it any longer, and she got on the Montrealer, which was a steam train, and she got off in Waterbury, Vermont, and she took the Couture Jitney to Morrisville, rented a second-story apartment, and two years later married a handsome French-Canadian ski instructor named Emile René Couture. So I grew up in Morrisville with the name Schubert in a family of Coutures, so I went by the name as a kid, Couture. Um, and have pretty much lived in Vermont most of the time, although I did have my father's family in New York, <coughs> and my, my father, my stepfather, um, was really a wonderful, wonderful person, and he, my grandmother was very concerned that I was being raised in the middle of nowhere in some farm community by a bunch of rubes, <laughs> and that I wouldn't amount to anything. So. Um, to make a long story short, my, my stepfather, who was very diplomatic, made arrangements for me to go to New York once a year to visit and spend two weeks with my grandmother. And he would drive me down to the Waterbury Station, and the train, which southbound was the Washingtonian, would stop for 17 minutes. He'd jump on with me, <clears throat> he'd find my berth, and he'd just say, bye and he would give the porter a dollar, which was real money in those days. And the porter, all of whom in those days were black, um, <clears throat> would come, put me in my pajamas, tuck me in, bring me a ginger ale, get me up the next morning when we were coming in on the elevated in down under Park Avenue, um, get me dressed, fold my thing up into the ceiling, and uh, get me set on the bench with my little suitcase. And then when we pulled into Penn Station, he would walk me out and turn me over to my grandmother or one of her domestics. She lived in an 18-room apartment on 71st and Park Avenue. And I would spend the next two weeks going to the Russian Tea Room and the Metropolitan Opera, the old opera, and the museums. And I'd lie in bed at night sobbing because I wanted to be home with my friends in Morrisville. <laughs> but as I can't remember who said it, I think it was Nietzsche, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <clears throat> so in retrospect, living in what was then a very schizophrenic world, um, I have a lot to be grateful for. But I have always adhered to my roots in Vermont. Thank you. 
So, um, I <clears throat> I started writing seriously when I retired from business. Um, I'd been writing informally all my life, um, and I started I started writing short stories. And my first book was in 2008, came out with what's called a hybrid publisher, and we'll talk about that later. It's called The Memorial Stories, and it's stories of people behaving badly and sometimes goodly um, in Memorial County. And it was funny, when it, when it first came out, I was invited over to Morrisville, and I was panicked because I wasn't sure that I'd changed everybody's names quite enough. <laughs> And we're in the Congregational Church in Morrisville because there were too many people to fit in the library. And <clears throat> one very large woman got up and she looked at me and she said, Billy Couture, I know every damn person in that book. <laughs> <laughs> practically ran out of the church. And I didn't recognize her. She was my third grade teacher. Um, so then I followed it up with a book that I had to write. Um, it was very difficult, um, and um, I think I have a copy of it here, maybe I don't. It's a collection of short stories that has done really well over time, um, and it's called Fat People. Um, I have struggled with food all my life. I've weighed as much as 490 pounds, and, <coughs> um, and I just... I needed to write this book, and I wrote it. It's a collection of short stories, and it's not, it's not about diets. It's not about anything that helps one lose weight. It is designed to tell stories that have people have a deeper understanding of what it is to have food both be your best friend and your worst enemy. Um, and it still sells very well. Um, and then uh, I wrote a, my first novel, which takes place on Lake Willoughby, um, in a hill farm above Mount Pisgah. Um, <clears throat> and um, God, I can't remember the sequence. Um, that's this one. It's called Panhead. Terrible title, because nobody knows what a panhead is except me. It is a a type of Harley Davidson motorcycle engine. And it's not a motorcycle book. <laughs> so, um, and then I did a book called Photographic Memory, which is close as I would ever dare get to an autobiography. And I always send copies of my books out to the family, including my two former wives, who I'm very close friends with. And I put a note in the front of the book the woman in this is not you. <laughs> um, and then I wrote Lila and Theron, um, which has done really well. Um, it was published on an imprint of Simon & Schuster and is distributed by Simon & Schuster. <clears throat> it's actually the backstory. Um, people's favorite short story in the Lamoille stories was one called Lila's Bucket. And everybody would ask me about it, and, and so I just wrote the backstory of Lila's Bucket, and this has done very well. My newest book um, is called The Priest, and it is not about pedophilia. I just have to say that. Um, I, um, and I'll, I'll say a few words about it and read you a very short passage, and then we'll just open it up and have a conversation together. Um, I was raised a Catholic in a small French-Canadian community, <coughs> Morrisville, and um, I knew the Mass. I was an altar boy when I was seven years old. I knew the Mass in French, Latin, and English, and I absolutely believed everything that Father Omer Dufault taught us and the nuns who came down from Quebec uh, for catechism on Saturday. <clears throat> and um, and it's interesting because when I was 13, my grandmother called me up and she said um, I'd been going to school and getting actually a really good education in Morrisville. They were almost entirely older women. They didn't care about my self-esteem. 
They didn't want to make me feel good. They wanted to know I was learning. And they were really clear about that. <clears throat> My grandmother said, you're going to Exeter. And I said, what's Exeter? So she explained it. And my stepfather, God bless him, said, it's a great opportunity, you need to go. So I went and he drove me down with my steamer trunk and looked around at all this stuff and he said, I'm going back to Morrisville. And I was introduced to my roommate. And my roommate sort of looks at me, I was heavy and, you know, he sort of looks at me and he goes, what are you? And I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. He said, well, like, what race, what religion? And I said, oh, I'm a Catholic. And he looked kind of disappointed and stared at his shoes. <laughs> so to be polite, I said, well, what are you? And he said, oh, I'm a Jew. And I said, oh, what's a Jew? <laughs> 13 years old, Morrisville, Vermont. What kind of a name do you think Schubert is? <laughs> German Jewish. My great uncle was Alfred Stieglitz. You know, we were related to the, you know, the Cunes and the Lobes, and I never knew. And I would jokingly, you know, when I finally figured it out, I would say, oh yeah, I'm from an anti-Semitic Jewish family. <laughs> <laughs> the proper term being assimilationist. <clears throat> and one final story on that, and I'll stop. My grandmother decided I needed to see the world. For some reason, she took me to Bogota, Colombia. I was 12 years old, and uh, I said, it was Sunday, and I was feeling badly because I couldn't go to church. And I said, Shoops, what, what religion are you? And she just looked panicked. And she said, um, well, uh, um, I'm, I'm ethical culture. So I'm like, I'm ticking through the white churches in Morrisville, Congregationalist, Methodist, no ethical culture. And I said, where's the ethical culture church? And she said, oh, it's on WQXR radio Saturday morning. <laughs> At which point I was totally lost. But ethical, the Ethical Culture Society, I later learned, of course, was, was really the sort of philosophical and religious community of non-observant, Jewish people in New York. Um, anyway, so um, this is, it's not about any specific priest. I, when, when I was 19, I read Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, and in that is a story within a story called The Legend of the Grand Inquisitor, in which Ivan, who's the sort of Sybaritic anarchist brother, tells his brother, um, Alyosha, who is a monk, um, the story of the legend of the Grand Inquisitor, which is really an amazing and wonderful story. And I walked away from the Catholic Church and I never went back. But having said that, three of my closest friends in life have been three Catholic priests. And we retained those friendships until they died. Not one of them ever tried to get me back into the church. Our friendship was just about real love and, and you know, appreciation of one another and intellectual curiosity. And so <clears throat> I wrote this book not based on any one of them, but um, based on my very mixed relationship with Catholicism, which I still, you know, it, it still is deeply imbued in me. And I think it's fair to say I have a love-hate relationship with it. Um, it, it. It gave me an ethical framework, which informs much of who I am today. Um, but it also betrayed me in many ways and of course the latest of which we're all sort of living through in a, in a horrible way, but the book is not about that. Um, the book is much more about the incredible difficulty a lot of boys are having in our culture today becoming men. Because gender roles are changing, and they're changing in many ways for the better, I believe. I mean, everybody sees it differently. 
Um, <clears throat> but it's very confusing. And I mean, I'm sure there are people in the room who know, you know, males who are 35 and 40 years old who are still boys. <laughs> they've, never, they've never become men. And I don't mean men in the macho sense. I mean men in the, the mature sense of who they are. And this book is really about that. Um, it's about uh, a young boy who's a Catholic. And um, he, when he sort of reaches the age of puberty, he's so appalled by what he sees and, and afraid that at the age of 12, he decides to become a Catholic priest because he knows Catholics are celibate and he won't have to confront all the complexities of what he's beginning to live through. Um, and the book is really about his spiritual migration um, from that place to actually becoming a living, breathing human being. And I'll read you a couple of just very, very short segments, um, say a few more words about it, answer any questions about it, and then I will um, We'll open it up and well, we can talk about whether or not you have a book lurking inside you or a memoir or whether you sometimes dream about writing. And it's not always books and it's not always written. It may be storytelling. So um, <clears throat> this chapter is called My Early Calling. I decided to become a priest when I was 12. What little I'd heard on the playground about sex and how babies were conceived terrified me. When I made up my child's mind to become a priest, I'd been abusing myself for a year and confessing my sins weekly so I would not go to hell if I were to die suddenly. My first sensations of arousal began when I graduated from the infantile world of the bathtub to the privacy and maturity of a shower sometime in fifth grade. The surprising sensations came from soaping myself all over and scrubbing, as my mother said, my dirty parts, as I had been taught. The unfocused sensation was pleasant, and I often luxuriated in the shower until called out by a parent. Since I slept in the same room as my older brother, Rosaire, the shower was my only private place as a child. In Saturday Catechism, Sister Therese made clear to us that dying with the sin of self-abuse on our soul meant an eternity of hellfire. To ensure our understanding of hell as the penalty for self-abuse, she asked, how many of you have ever burned your hand on a kitchen stove or a wood stove? We all raised our hands. Now imagine that pain all over your body for eternity and you will understand what hell will be like if you die with a mortal sin on your soul. We were all terrified. When I was eight, the house three doors down from us caught fire in the middle of the night and burned to the ground. It was one of the first house fires in our neighborhood to be electrified, the uh, first houses in our neighborhood to be electrified, having been heated by a wood-fired furnace in the basement for 70 years. We assumed the novelty of electric wiring started the fire, and although, although it was never proven. The firemen worked through the night to keep the neighboring houses from catching fire, as the house itself was too far gone to be saved. We heard that Selma Travers died in the fire. Although we only saw her at church, we knew her as a kindly lady who gave alms to the poor and spent summers knitting on her expansive front porch and offering passers-by a glass of her homemade lemonade. Her nephew, Buford, was in the fire brigade and ran into the burning house to try and save her, but died when the second floor collapsed. A boy at school described the charred remains he saw as he walked by the house the following day. His description brought further to life the horrors that we would experience if we were to die with a mortal sin on our soul. <clears throat> Rosier, uh, the brother, was nice to me, but I always thought he saw me as weak and unwilling to take life on. 
At about the same time, I began noticing girls at school and listening to the older boys on the playground talk about them in a way I didn't understand. I knew girls were different from boys, as I had seen my mother change my baby sister's diapers. My parents only spoke of sex in the abstract, alluding to its purpose of making babies. It happened only between married couples. I could make no connection between the security, warmth, and pleasure I felt under a deluge of warm water behind the privacy of a shower curtain and the mothers in town laboring through the grocery store straining against the counterweight of a late pregnancy. Given the lectures I'd heard at home, school and catechism on modesty and hygiene, the idea that nature's design enabled sex seemed unimaginable. The older playground boys, though, seemed to be experts on the subject and spoke graphically of their considerable experience. I was naive enough to believe what I heard, making the whole prospect of sex more terrifying and unnatural. I understood that priests could never marry or have children, and so chose that vocation when I was 12. Hardly the spiritual epiphany we read about in the lives of the saints, but more a flight from the childhood fears made vivid by Sister Therese in catechism and the older boys on the playground. The solemnity and consistency of the Catholic Mass, its processions, vestments, evocative statues, commandments, sacraments, and feast days in which I was a regular acolyte, offered a reassuring alternative to the demands I would suffer as an, an, as an adult expected to go forth and multiply. Um, the story moves forward um, and has a very surprising ending. It's not what you would expect. Um, I think it's fair to say that in many ways he becomes a whole person. And the battle, of course, that he's struggling with as he gets older is the battle between um, dogma, you know, hard doctrine, religious doctrine, and Christ's, you know, um, what Christ says, which is to go forth and love people and be kind. And that, of course, is very much what the church has been going through for centuries. You know, do we, do we model the life of Christ? Do we love people who anger us? Do we do things that make people's lives better? Or do we memorize the rules and follow the rules exactly? It's a, it's a really... Uh, a really complex issue and one that haunts the church to this day. I've just finished a new novel, which I won't go into huge detail on, but it'll either make me or break me. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea where it came from. Um, it's really a novella, and it is with critical readers now, and is going to the editor next week. And it's, going, it's not a graphic novel, but it will have illustrations like the original does. I've rewritten Dante's Inferno 700 years later. And my guide is not Virgil. My guide is Walt Whitman. And it is, um, it's very different. Hell is not what Dante made it out to be. And I read, Dante, I read the Inferno when I was fairly young and it, or scared the daylights out of me. Um, but what, what intrigued me in writing this, and it took me a long time, is what was sin 700 years ago? A lot of it is not sin today. You know, um, heresy is not sin. You know, failure to believe is not sin. But we have a whole new concept of sin that is scaled and very different. Um, homicide, thou shalt not kill, you know, when Dante wrote, was people fighting each other with swords or poisoning. And now, it's infinitely more complex. We have drones. I actually interviewed a sniper, a professional sniper, 
and he explained, you know, what what he did. And I said, I asked him how many people he killed, and he said seven. And I said, how did you feel when you saw them die? And he said, I never saw anyone die. And I said, really? He said, yeah, you don't understand. Snipers never see the result of their kill. Mm -hmm. There's always two people. He said, I would get the target perfectly aligned in my rifle sight. And when I knew I was there, I would close my eyes and pull the trigger and turn away. Mm -hmm. And my spotter would say yes or no. That's all I ever heard. He said, I never saw anyone die. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really intrigued me in some other interviews is one of the things that was so attractive to the military about drone warfare is the, the intimacy of killing is a big part of PTSD. And although the military struggles with it and don't like to admit the scale of it, it's massive. I mean, they are, they are just overwhelmed with the mental health issues around PTSD. And they thought, well, drone warfare will solve this. Mm. Drone pilots get PTSD. Mm. And the, the military never thought this would be the case. Mm. So enough of that. <coughs> um, that uh, presumably will be out in the fall. And um, Jeff Danziger, uh, the national cartoonist, is going to do the illustrations for it. Um, so, does anyone have any questions about um, this or any of the books or anything before we turn to the larger topic of whether there's a book lurking in you? <laughs> any questions at all? Yes? Did you know that you were a writer when you were a kid? Did I know? That you were a writer when you were a kid. It's a wonderful question. I, the first time I decided I wanted to write was um, when I was in my early teens. Mm -hmm. And um, I wrote some poetry and I wrote some short stories. Um, <clears throat> and then I just got immersed into you know, raising a family and starting businesses. And, and I'd write occasionally. But it wasn't until I retired in 2008 that I really turned my attention to writing. And, and made the time and the space because it takes time. Mm -hmm. um, so it, you know, um, I've always been intrigued by writing. My father, who died before I was born, um, was a playwright. Um, nothing huge or fancy, but that was what he really wanted to do, and he wrote several plays. Um, so you didn't do a book until you retired. You didn't. I did. I never did a book until I was retired. I had stuff published in, you know, literary magazines or, you know, college literary magazines, but no book. Mm -hmm. And the first book, Lamoille Stories, um, <clears throat> was picked up, one of the short stories in it ran in Vermont Life. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a hybrid publisher, and I'll explain this when we talk, called me up and said, it's a great story, have you got more stories in you, would you like to do a book? And I went, mm, yeah. That sounds good. So I wrote out the rest of the stories and submitted them, and they published it. And in fairness, they did everything they said they would do. You know, they don't, they're not going to make you a famous writer, and they're not going to drive sales. But um, she, she did every single thing that she said she would do. Um, and the book kept selling, and she was running out. So I said, look, can I reacquire the rights? And she was very generous, and she said, sure. So I took it back and republished it under my own imprint. Right. Mm -hmm. And all of my books, except Lila and Theron, I've self-published. Mm -hmm. So I've published with a hybrid publisher, I've published with a traditional publisher, and I've self-published. So I've done all three. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, you know, I mean, it has changed, I'll say a few words about publishing. Does anyone have any other questions about this book? Or um, <clears throat> When I was young, there, there were two poles in publishing. 
There was vanity publishing, and there was traditional publishing. And vanity publishing was nobody wanted your book, nobody cared whether it was any good or bad, you just paid a few thousand bucks and they'd put it out for you. Um, they wouldn't market it. They, they would run classified ads this big in the Matter Saturday <laughs> Review saying this book was published, you know, so and so, and it was, it was a company called Vantage Press. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then there were the traditional publishers, and the great ones were Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, Knopf, who was a first cousin of my grandmother, um, <coughs> Random House, <coughs> excuse me, and, um, and they, they really wanted to find great literature. And they, I mean, Alfred Knopf used to travel all through Europe interviewing and looking at manuscripts from new writers. That whole system is pretty much gone now. Um, everybody is no looking now for the next James Patterson, who, by the way, made $65 million last year and has 200 people working for him writing his books. <laughs> and has been very generous with independent bookstores. Mm. He's been giving grants to independent bookstores, God bless him. Um, <clears throat> but um, the publishers now are all looking for the next 1%. Mm -hmm. And the mid-list, which is their list of publishers, uh, of writers, um, that typically sell in the 10 to 60, 70,000 range, which can be very profitable, um, <clears throat> they don't pay much attention to them. Um, and the backlist is pretty much dead at this point. These are people who have done very well, sold you know anywhere from twenty to a hundred thousand books, and are putting out new books, but they're not going to sell in the hundreds of thousands or the millions. Um, <clears throat> so the publishers are sort of fighting over that one percent. Now, having said that, there are some really good midlist publishers. Um, there's people like Chelsea Green, um, what's it, I can never remember his name, the guy in Boston who does the beautiful books. Oh, um. You know who I mean. I know exactly. Yeah, what it'll come to one yeah. of us. But, <laughs> um, Sabine. Pardon? Godine. Yes, yep. David Godine. Thank you. I just received yeah. you. Yes, David um. Godine. <laughs> and <laughs> and there's probably oh, a dozen others. Right. <laughs> um, so, there's a spectrum of publishing now that runs from street <clears throat> custom, you know, like making an Apple book of your family's pictures, to pure vanity publishing, where people hold their nose and publish it, um, to hybrid publishers um, with varying degrees of discrimination. There are some hybrid publishers who will publish anything you pay them to. There are others, and a couple in Vermont, like Green Writers Press, who are very thoughtful. They, they're not going to take something they think is just not valuable and is not going to serve either the writer or the publisher. Um, they're looking for good, credible books that the traditional industry is not going to take. Um, and then there's the traditional publishers. So what used to be, you know, vanity and traditional, has fleshed out now, so there's a lot of options. The metaphor that I, I often use is like when I was a kid, there were nurses and doctors <laughs> and nothing in between. Mm -hmm. Now it's a whole spectrum. Yeah. There are nurse practitioners and there are times when I'd rather see a nurse practitioner than a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, so th that's, that's a good thing. And the good news is that anybody really now can publish. And the bad news is that everybody is. <laughs> and the, the challenge, as I'm sure you can attest, is um, the, the one thing that's still broken in the system is what the industry calls discovery. It's very difficult unless you come into a bookstore like this and look around. It's very difficult to find new things that you want. A lot of people use Amazon for discovery, and then they buy in their local bookstore. Unfortunately, the inverse is true. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Morrow, who you 
you certainly know, is a good friend, and we were having lunch once, <clears throat> and he said, Bill, what would you say if three to ten times a day I walked up to a customer in my store and asked them to leave? I said, what are you talking about? He said, Amazon has an app that you can download on your phone. So I can walk over, pull a book out, leaf through it, open it up, which you know may spread the binding, and spend a few minutes reading the front and go, wow, I'd like that book. And I take it out and I scan the barcode and Amazon ships it to me the next day for two or three dollars less. And so North Shire Bookstore becomes a showroom for Amazon. And, you know, I'm completely sympathetic. I mean, I, I, and he's very polite. He said, look, I, you know, he doesn't throw people out of his store. He just says, you know, I really appreciate your coming in and looking around, but I can't afford to be a showroom for Amazon. If you want to buy from Amazon, that's fine, but you buy from Amazon. I have to pay to have these books on my shelf. And people are run the gamut from feeling really embarrassed and bad to, well, I have every right, you know. I mean, so it's, it's a time of tremendous change in publishing. Um, but it's created a lot of good opportunity. And one of the things that I find intriguing is that there are, there are established authors who, in some of their books, elect to self-publish. Mm -hmm. They walk away from their traditional publisher because it, it may be a higher risk um, thing they've written, or they may just want to try self-publishing, or <clears throat> they think it's going to be a tremendous success and you make much more money. I make more money in self-publishing than I do with Simon & Schuster. So, um, you know, it, it's, it is a really interesting time, but you do, you do have to be careful if you're thinking about writing. Now, let me just ask informally, I'm not gonna hold you to it, are, are any of you thinking of writing in any form? It can be a short story for a literary magazine. It can be a novel. Um, it can be a memoir. Are some of you, you are? Yeah, I know you are. Yeah. <laughs> you are. Good. Wonderful. Um, and I would, really, I would really encourage you to pursue it. Um, because one never knows. The thing... Um, would it be helpful if I explained to you my process? Absolutely. Yeah, that'd be great, yeah. I'm happy to do it. Um, when a, a novel occurs to me, and people write in two different ways. Some people write very methodically. They outline, you know, let's say it's an, a fictional novel. I, I can't speak to, to uh, nonfiction because other than my VPR commentaries and op-ed pieces, I don't write nonfiction. I write fiction. <clears throat> something occurs to me, one person will sit down and think it all the way through, right till the end. They'll outline it, they'll list all their characters, they'll describe their characters, they'll, they'll plot the narrative, they'll have it all figured out. I don't do that, and, and many authors don't. I just start writing. And the characters sometimes surprise me. You know, they, they just start forming on the page. And sometimes a plot twist will occur to me, and I'll write it, and I'm surprised. So I'm sort of what they call a discovery writer. I just start writing. And other, other people, as I say, are very methodical. There's no right or wrong. They're both, they both work fine. It just depends on who you are. So I write it once, and I typically write in the morning, and I can't write for more than two hours because I can't sit for more than two hours. <coughs> So when I come up in the morning to start writing again, I read what I read the day before. And I may spend the first hour editing and cleaning that up, taking out adverbs, taking out adjectives, finding better verbs, um, eliminating extraneous language. Um, and then I write ahead for another hour, hour and a half. 
So I may only write, um, you know, a thousand to two thousand words a day. Then when it's all done, I go back and reread it, and I do that again. So I go through it at least twice. Then I go out to critical readers, who sometimes are friends, but sometimes they're people I don't even know. And, um, and I pay them a modest amount, $100. And they are not literary editors. They're not copy editors. They're readers. And what I want them to do is to read the manuscript, and sit down with me for half an hour or 40 minutes and tell me what worked and what didn't. And it's incredibly valuable. And who I pick depends on what I've written. In this novel, The Priest, <clears throat> I picked a Catholic priest who I did not know. And in the course of our discussion, um, I found out he was gay and he was out. And he'd been persecuted by the church for years He'd been sent to mental institutions, and then he was finally accepted by the church as a gay, out priest. Mm -hmm. And what he said, which I thought was quite wonderful, is he said, what the church hasn't figured out is you can be gay and celibate. <laughs> Just because you're gay doesn't mean you're abusing people. And he was incredibly helpful, and he, he liked the book. He was most helpful technically. You know, I would say something and he'd say, oh, you said a surplus and you meant an alb, referring to vestments. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, I, I made a comment in here about, you know, in the wedding, in the wedding service, um, you shall obey your husband and a couple of other things. And he said, you know, you were right about all these before um, the, I can't remember what it was, one of the big papal changes in the church. And he said, you either have to change these or you have to back the date up before that papal encyclical where they made these changes. So that kind of technical stuff is really important because if a reader's reading along and they go, hmm, that doesn't sound right, mm -hmm. you've distracted them from the story. And that's why editing is so important. The other thing I would say, I talk to a lot of young writers, and, you know, I can tell immediately whether they have a chance at being successful, not by what they read, but by their attitude. If somebody says, will you read my manuscript? You know, you're going to love it. And, you know, I, need, I want you to blurb it. And, you know, they go on and on and on, and I say, what if I don't like it at all? What if I think it's terrible? Oh, no, you're going to love it. There's nothing more to say, because the writer has already made the decision about the quality of their book. And the question that you have to ask yourself is, am I writing for myself, or am I writing to be heard and understood? So that process of a critical reader becomes really important. And I don't pick people who are my friends who are going to say, oh, Bill, God, I read the book. I loved it. That's not what I want. I want somebody to sit down and say, you know, I, I, I think the story overall was really good, but this character just never gelled for me. You need to make something more of this character. Or, you know, there's this plot twist here, and, I, you know, I didn't... I didn't believe it. I want that feedback. So the critical reader thing is probably one of the most um, one of the most valuable things I do. And then the new book, which is called The Alago, is now out with five critical readers. Um, then when I get all their feedback, um, I interview them and I look for the trends. I look for the consistencies in what the five people have said. Um, and I write those down, and then I go back and I rewrite the book. Um, and then it goes to a literary editor. And I have, for my first five books, I was using a woman in New York, Hope Matheson, 
who is a professional editor. She's Peter Matheson's, um, Peter Matheson's niece. Wow. Um, the guy who wrote A Play in the Fields of the Lord, and he's, you know, he's dead now, but, um, and she was terrific. And she was really good because most of the editing she did was nonfiction. And so this was fiction. So she would be even more critical. Um, and then I would bring the manuscript and it would then go to a copy editor, which is the person who reads the whole manuscript and does everything from fixing commas, semicolons, you know, um, everything to, to scratching out unnecessary adverbs or adjectives to circling a paragraph and saying, this is mush, rewrite it, you know what I mean? Um, but they're, they're the people who have to remove all the technical flaws. And that too is important because they're distractions. If I misspell something, or um, if there's a discontinuity, you know, if I say somebody is blonde in chapter three, <laughs> And four months later, they're brunette. You know, the reader goes, oh, what's, that? what's that about? And that's the thing you don't want to have happen. You want people to just submerge themselves in the narrative and the sense of place and never be pulled out. So um, then after that's done, I have a finished manuscript. And if it's going to a publisher, it then goes off to the publisher. If it is, um, if I'm doing it myself, it goes to a designer. And I've used three different designers over the years. Um, um, and they've all been pretty terrific. Um, and their job is to design what's called the cover wrap, which is the back, the spine, and the front. If you look carefully at a book, you'll see that this, this, and this are one graphic. Then what's called the, the text block, which is everything from the first page to the last, is the second piece. And you need those two files, digital files. Um, one thing that a lot of people self-publishing often forget is the indicia page. And you may, sometimes it's called the copyright page, mm -hmm. but um, you're not going to be taken seriously unless you do this correctly. You need an ISBN number. Um, you don't need, but it's helpful to have a Library of Congress number. You need, um, I can't remember what they call it, but it's what librarians use for filing. It replaces. Pardon? Dewey Decimal System? It, it's very much, it's the or modern... Library of Congress. Cataloging, yeah, the cataloging it's, data. It's, it's the cataloging yeah. data, exactly, yeah. And, um, and the copyright information, um, I put my bibliography in there, the list of my other books, where there is been numbers, so if somebody comes into a store and says, what else has Bill Schubert written? Um, the bookstore owner can find it with the ISBN number. Um, publishing information, distribution information, and the credits. Um, front cover and title page art, um, design, literary editor, copy editor, um, and then, you know, but, but some people just forget this. And this, if you're going to be taken seriously, it's important to do it. And it takes me 20 minutes to do this. It's not rocket science. Um, and you also need to get the barcode, which you can just get, you know, online. You can buy a bunch of ISBN numbers for your own publishing company, and you can use them and assign them as you want, and then they, and they will send you a barcode as a file. So that becomes important. And what I, what I tell my designer is, your job is to design the cover wrap and the text and to send it to Ingram which is who I use, um, and to get a proof copy, approve the proof copy, and get approval from Ingram that your files match their manufacturing spec. So I don't have to do anything. That's the deal with my designer. 
So they will call me up and say, I've gotten approval from Ingram. You know, here's a, here's a press proof. What do you think? And then we're a go. Um, costs. Um, by choice, because it's a lot. If I came up to you and said, listen, I've just written a 300-page book. You know, I'd love to have you read the whole thing and sit down with me for an hour or two and talk to me about what you found or blurb it or whatever. I've asked you for 25, 30 hours of your life. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. So um, I, depending on who it is, I will pay somewhere between $100 or $200, which is still a, a good deal to get that kind of good critical feedback. So I might have five or six or 800 bucks in critical readers. The literary editor um, is typically five to 600 bucks. The copy editor is typically five to 600 bucks. And a copy editor does really a lot of work. I bought that book from you. Um, I can't remember Dryers. his name. Dryer's English. Yeah, yeah, he's the copy editor for Random House, mm -hmm. and it's a great mm -hmm. book if you want to understand copy editing. Mm -hmm. um, and um, um, they they get another five or seven hundred bucks. They're typically by the hour. Um, the designer, um, I pay, depending on the complexity, between. A thousand and fifteen hundred, and then I might have to pay on top of that a license fee for the art. Um, for example, <coughs> Lila and Theron. I didn't have to pay for any of this because Simon and Schuster did. But <coughs> this is a Richard Brown photograph, and Richard Brown, like Peter Miller, your own Peter Miller here in town, is one of the iconic Vermont photographers, and his. His photographs are on um, three of my books. Um, that's a Peter Miller photograph. Uh, the Lamoille Stories version two is, and this is. Um, and um, I pay him $300 or $300 for a one-time non-exclusive use as a cover with the understanding that if the book sells over 5000 I'll send him another $200. Um, so if you add all that up, it costs me about um, $2,600 to $3,200 to self-publish a book professionally. So I get something that a bookstore owner is not going to be able to differentiate between whether I produced it or whether it was produced by Random House. And that's important. I mean, I've had people send me books that look like they were done on a mimeograph machine. And, you know, what does that say about how you feel about your work? So, um, um, and then um, working with Ingram, um, I get between 280 and 340 per book sold, which is much better than I would get with a conventional publisher. <laughs> so to date, all of my books except one have earned back whatever I've invested in them, and some of them have earned a lot more. I was lucky to cut a deal with Simon & Schuster so I paid the upfront cost, so they didn't have any recovery. I get $7 for every one of these that sells. It's a $20 book. Unheard of in public. <laughs> um, so that's sort of a, a general picture um, of self-publishing. I'm, I'd love to answer any questions you have. I've gobbled up a tremendous amount of time, but yes. When you talk about your readers, your, er, your first readers, yeah. where, and sometimes you don't know them, Yeah. where are you finding them? Are they being recommended to you? I, um, we had a foreign exchange student from Moldova who lived with us for a year, went for CVU. Her favorite class was creative writing at CVU. And um, during the teacher visits, I met her teacher, really interesting guy. 
And I said, would you consider being a critical reader? I'd love to. So it's sort of serendipitous? Pardon? It's Sir, sort of it, serendipitous. It is serendipitous, but you person? ask around, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you know people who are good readers, and you might mm -hmm. say, who, who do you know who's doing a lot of reading? You know, um, and I always pick a young person. Mm -hmm. One of the critical readers for my new book is, um, is a woman we're using as an intern for the Vermont Authors Project, and she was absolutely thrilled to do it. And I used our foreign exchange student um, as a critical reader for this. And she was thrilled to do it. She, she was 15 years old and spoke four languages. What does that say? And she was fluent in English. She read the book. She loved it uh, in a manuscript form. And she looks at me and she said, and this had been through two copy editors, the one I'd hired before I went to Simon & Schuster, and then Simon & Schuster hired their own copy editor. So it had been through two, the manuscript, but it hadn't been printed yet. She said, how long do you think a cat lives? And I said, well, you know, 15, 12, 20 years. She went, uh-huh. She said, well, you better go back and look at your book. I said, Marcella, what are you talking about? She said, you have a cat in the beginning named Mags. Mags <laughs> dies. You go out to the barn, you get another barn cat, and you bring in, and he's called Mags too. That same Mags is in the book 40 years later. <laughs> so, and I'm like, <laughs> this from a 15-year-old girl whose native language is Romanian. <laughs> So I always pick a young person um, as well. Wow. Other questions? How many copies yeah. do you typically generate? It's a, it's a great question um, because I don't do, um, I, I don't generally do offset printing, which mm -hmm. is where you have to make a thousand or fifteen or twenty-five hundred. Right. Just because I know too many would-be writers who have a basement <laughs> full of <laughs> books. Um, I use the LSI division of Ingram, and I will typically order to fill the pipeline um, anywhere from two to three hundred, and that's basically what I think the initial bookstore orders will be, plus the fifty to seventy-five review copies I need and copies I'm going to send to the family. So I kind of figure it out and I order them, and they ship those to me. And the, the way it works is, it's really interesting. They have an algorithm that determines the velocity of sale. So this, even though it's hardcover, is the initial run was done offset because it's much cheaper. Mm -hmm. And when the offset, uh, I think was 20, either 1500 or 2500, when the initial offset was sold, they then go to on-demand. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that there are no books in the warehouse and you order a book and they rush out and make one and ship it to you. They have on the shelf 5, 10, 25 that's based on what they call the velocity of sale. So if this book is, let's say, selling 25 copies a month, they're going to they're gonna have 25 on the shelf so they can ship immediately, because Ingram's whole thing is you get your books in two days. And um, so that's how they do it. And most major publishers now, their mid-list and their back-list is all on demand. Mm -hmm. And it costs about twice as much as offset, but you're saving a fortune on inventory. I mean, it's actually cheaper to pay more for a book and not have to carry inventory than it is otherwise. So. That's the answer. Yes? Do you know of a really good book that talks about, or do you have one, or would you like to write one, <laughs> um, about get, using your platform and using your marketing skills to generate demand? It's a That's really, the hard really part good of question. Yeah. yeah, it's a really good question. If you take a book that you've written to an agent and, you know, 
you've even been able to get in the door. Because agents now are the guardian of the publishing mm -hmm. industry. The publisher will not even look at a, a manuscript unless it comes in through an agent. And agents have are very well defended. Um, but um, the first question they will ask you is exactly what you just said. What's your platform? Mm -hmm. And um, my answer is this. My platform is I'm a public radio commentator. Um, up to a quarter of a million people hear my commentaries, which are every couple of weeks. They're not literary. They're political in most cases. Um, some of them are cultural. Um, I have 1,600 people who have opted in to get my commentaries, which I also use to notify of new book releases. Of those 1,600, about 45% actually open it. You know, it's one thing to send out 2,000 emails. That's actually a good percentage. Pardon? That's, that's like that's crazy good. good. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, and, and MailChimp will report. They'll say we sent out 1,800 and, you know, 900 people opened it. Um, so that's a piece of it. The other piece of it is coming and talking with people in bookstores, libraries, and book clubs. Um, and the other piece of it, which I just, I hate, is social media. I actually pay a woman $100 a month to do my social media. She's a wizard. And she gets raw material from me, and she manages my Facebook page. The embarrassing thing is, is I've got something like, I don't know, 2,000 people who look at me on Facebook and some of them are kids I went to school with and people I know and they say, oh, so good, how are you? And I never go, so I never answer any of them. You know, I, I, I have incredible ethical problems with Facebook. They are, they're getting hammered in Europe, as they should. And we're not hammering them so much over here because we don't hammer business very much, but um, um, I don't know, when I, when I first tried to look at Facebook and I would see, you know, somebody say, oh, I had a good bowel movement this morning. <laughs> and they're like, do I care? Do I really care? You know, I mean, so. But um, for some people, their platform is a blog. Mm -hmm. um, for, you know, it's different for different people. But that is the first question a publisher because they want to know how you're going to sell the book because they're not going to. But when you're doing it for yourself, you're making, what's an average an average sale level for, I mean, how many books do you sell in a year? How many books do I sell? Mm -hmm. It really depends on the title and how much work I put into it. Mm -hmm. My biggest selling book is about 8,000. Uh -huh. And my least selling book is just under 1,000, mm -hmm. which is enough to, to make the money back. Make the money back. So, you know, it's not like, and I don't have delusions of grandeur. I'm not going to, you know. But you're going out and finding 8,000 people to buy your book. So I was just wondering what that process is for you. Yeah, it's, it's basically what I said. I mean, when Lila and Theron came out, I kept a database of 55 events that I was doing around New England, mm -hmm. which okay. ran from Bridgeside to you know, the other 20 Vermont stores, from New Hampshire, Massachusetts stores, libraries, um, just every chance I get. And of course, you know, I want Jane Lindholm to interview me. <laughs> sure. um, and, and actually, one of the best things I did was Bill Sayers' show on WDEV. I'm, you know, he, Bill's very conservative, and um, we're good friends, and I'm very liberal, and I'm sort of his token liberal. <laughs> and um, he absolutely fell in love with Lila and Theron. Just loved the book, and he said, come on, let's talk about it. So we talked for an hour about this book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, the, all those things make a difference, but it's hard work. And the, the one thing I will tell you is even the traditional publishers, unless you're a Catherine Patterson or a Chris Bojelian, mm -hmm. they're not going to do anything to sell your book. Right. They'll feed the pipeline. Um, 
They don't pay for a book tour. Um, they want to know what you're doing to sell their book. Um, so it's, you know, you're very much on your own. So you've got, you've got um, public access media taking your yeah, picture Yeah, absolutely. Yourself. I mean, all these things matter. Um, Is that hard to do? To get... It, it, <laughs> actually, the, do you, is there a time thing? No, Will you keep me yeah, just keep me no, honest? No, we're totally Thank fine. You. So we actually here at the bookstore um, have Orca. Um, they've voluntarily they actually reached out to us for a couple of different events we were doing this spring to come in. But they um, Orca often comes in. Um, we host extempo storytelling a couple of times mm -hmm. a year and some other events. And so that was how we originally. Um, get to know the folks at Orca, and so they've come out to um, other events that we have. So, mm -hmm. yeah, which, so that's great, but it's also just a lot of what you're saying really resonates because, well, as a business, a yeah. bookstore, we're always trying to be very creative in how we get um, the word out of we're having an event tonight or hey, just come, in, <laughs> come sure. into my store. Yeah. Um, so, something so being able to work with um, authors and Public access is great for us too. So it's and interesting to hear you <coughs> about your platform. Yeah, and, and there are there are there are radio station and TV yeah. stations, you know, who are looking for content, uh -huh. and there's not a lot of them, and there's almost no papers that do book reviews anymore. Very very few. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it costs you very little for a book. You know, so I, I will typically send out 75 or 80 books, you know, to Jane Lindholm or the different radio stations and, you know, we'll get some interviews and um, the, um, there was one other thing I was going to say about that. Oh, I've done something which I think is really unique. I, I mean, I'm not sure. I just did it. <coughs> I've been doing audio books. And I've been using a producer in Shelburne who's really wonderful. Mm. And I do some of the reading and other people, you know, depends on the book. Um, and what I did is I took 10 short stories and um, it was, it's a total of 10 stories. Maybe seven of them are short stories and three of them are extracts that stand alone. And I, I had my web person build a web page that says read me a story and you go there and it's really beautifully designed and there are 10 of my stories and you can just click on one on your cell phone or your computer or your tablet and the story will be read to you professionally they're not long you know I think the longest one might be 18 20 minutes um, but it's a way for somebody to discover and sample your work that's mm -hmm. um, not just putting the print on your website. Um, if you go, if you, my website is shubart.com, it's real simple, it's my last name.com, and you click on read me a story, they're all there. And I'm getting amazingly good feedback. So if somebody reads a short story from the Lamoille stories or Fat People or Lila and Theron, and they're intrigued, they can just click on the title and then the book comes up. Mm -hmm. And then the book sends you to the independent bookstores. Um, so, yeah. one caveat if you're thinking of, don't for God's sakes do anything with CreateSpace at Amazon. <laughs> yeah, don't and, do it. Pardon, don't, don't do it because you will alienate every bookseller. I mean, Mike DeSanto, who owns, is it four or five bookstores now? Five bookstores. If you bring him in your book and you say, oh, I want you to carry my book, he's going to open it up and it's going to say, created by CreateSpace at Amazon. And he's just simply going to say, nope, not going to carry your book. And I am really sympathetic to that. The, the dilemma that writers face is, if you go to my website, it lists all of Vermont's bookstores. Yeah. It has them all there. It says you can buy my book at any of these independent Vermont bookstores. And then it says you can buy it online at IndieBound, which is the organization for the bookstores. 
And it says the last thing is Amazon. Because the reality is you can make an ethical decision that you're not going to send anyone to Amazon. But frankly, if you're trying to sell books, it's impractical. Mm -hmm. Because there are people who buy my books in England and they buy them from Amazon. Mm -hmm. You know, it's although it's although any bookstore in England <laughs> can order my book mm -hmm. from Ingram. Mm -hmm. So right. other questions? Yes. So how do you make it go from in here to a book? Because <laughs> Yeah. I can tell, like, I've been told I can tell really good stories. Yep. But I don't know how to, like, get them down. In print. Yeah. That's a, it's a really good question. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something that's really important to figure out. Some people are writers, and some people are storytellers. And there's... There's a difference, and it's, it's not a difference of imagination. Whether you tell the story or whether you write it, if it's a great story, it's a great story. The only difference is the medium and the craft, the technology. Writing is a skill, and you can study it, and you can learn it, and you can get better and better at it. Um, the thing I recommend more than anything is one of the best ways to become a great writer is to do a lot of reading, which I'm sure you do. And, you know, we learn 70% by example and 30% by being taught. So reading is really important. <clears throat> but the, the next most important thing is don't sit around and say, I have writer's block. I'm going to say there's no such thing as writer's block. And, you know, I, there's 20 authors that would just shoot me in the forehead if they heard me say that. Um, get into the discipline of sitting down whenever your time is, whether it's at night, afternoon, or morning, and just write for one hour. Let it flow. Look at what you've written, you know, and you'll have a sense if it works. Share it with other people. There are writing groups now all over Vermont, you know, and, and share your work and get feedback. But the most important thing that a writer does is to sit down and write. And it's not perfect. I wrote one novel that I put tons of work into and I gave it out to critical readers and they, they came back to me and they said, this novel doesn't work. And I, I, I knew why. I created this story, but I was so enraged. It was about corruption in the pharmaceutical industry. I was so enraged at the pharmaceutical industry that I was just preaching all the time, and I lost my characters, you know. So the most important thing is just do it. And if you don't feel like do it, doing it, sit down at a keyboard and do it anyway. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Um, other questions? Yes. I don't have a question, but I, but I just as a, as a bookstore owner and as a person who loves to read and, and, and loves books and paper and everything, there have been so many times that over the years that we, you know, somebody will come in and say, you know, I'm, I'm an author, you know, I'd like, I'd like to, you know, you to carry my book, and. It is so, I mean, a lot of times it's like, oh, this is great, but it's it's exciting for us, too, you know, to to have somebody come in and to share that with, you know, with us. And there have been many times that, you know, we just received um, a couple of months ago a book from a woman who came into my store. I had only been open for two weeks, and this is like almost 10 years ago now. We'd only been open for two weeks, and we struck up a friend, you know, just a great conversation, a friendship. She's come back a couple of times over the years because she has friends in the area to pop in. And she sent us her um, uh, advanced reader's copy of her book that's coming out next month. And we've all read it, and we're like, oh my God, this is amazing. That's a friendship that went back yeah. 10 years almost. Yeah. And so it's just, you know, 
I, you know, it's exciting for us. That's that's a really good point, and <clears throat> I'm going to say something you're too polite to say, mm -hmm. and that is, <clears throat> you can't you can't create a book and walk into a bookstore mm -hmm. and say, you have to carry my book. It's terrific. And by the way, I'd like a window, and you know, just just start with 50 copies, and when those sold call me up and can you pay me now? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm sure you hear this. The reality is the bookstore is your partner and you have to treat them like a partner. And you have to understand at least the rudiments of how difficult their business is. They have to buy hundreds of books and pay for them and let them sit on a shelf until somebody buys them. There, there is, it's a consignment business, so they can return them if they don't sell. But it costs money to maintain inventory. And there are bookstores that have a very, and this is one of the things that the Vermont Authors Project is working on, is helping authors understand how a bookstore works. And there are bookstores that have a consignment policy which is, oh, you have a new book? Terrific. Well, we have no idea how it's going to sell. You probably don't either. You give me two copies. I'll put them on the shelf. And um, I'm not going to pay you for them. If they sell, I have your email address. I'll pay you for those two, and you bring me two more. And if they sell fast, maybe I'll take four. But that's, that's understanding your business partner. And, you know, I hear stories from bookstore owners. <laughs> People come in, oh, just start with 50. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, here's an invoice. You know, I mean, what? So that's, that's really important. Yeah, I'm really glad you raised that. Other thoughts? Questions? What's the Vermont Authors Project about? Um, it's been going for about three years, and it's not heavily public yet, but it, it will be more so. It's really a partnership. Um, it, it's interesting. There's, there are 250 credible writers in Vermont. I'm not talking about, you know, just people cranking out something. I'm talking about people who have published credible books of all kinds. Um, and there are 250 libraries, about 30 of which welcome authors. There are, it changes all the time, but there's actually about 22 independent bookstores. Those numbers are the highest per capita numbers in the United States. I mean, Vermont is a literary state. People read, they buy books, they, they use libraries. Um, there are a lot of bookstores, I mean, uh, book clubs. Um, so we got very intrigued with the idea of supporting local authors and we partnered with the Vermont Department of Tourism and Marketing and we're actually putting the Vermont authors and all the independent bookstores up on the Vermont Tourism and Marketing site. We're writing uh, about Vermont authors in their publications and we did a beautiful thing. I actually have the, the artwork in the car. Um, at the welcome areas, um, at the welcome area in Guilford, we had an entire wall. It said, learn about Vermont through the eyes of a Vermont writer. And we had profiled, you know, some really eight, you know, typical Vermont writers like uh, Archer Mayer and, and um, um, you know, just people who are really quite well known but who really write about Vermont. And then there was a card with all of the independent bookstores in Vermont. Their addresses, their websites, and <clears throat> it was kind of an experiment. And we had to replace the author cards and the bookstore cards every few days. Wow, that's great. Tourists were just gobbling them up. So I just met um, um, a couple of us, three of us, including our intern from UVM, met with the Tourism and Marketing Council and had a really wonderful meeting. They are very anxious to promote Vermont bookstores, uh, Vermont authors, so it's, it's, it, it'll become more public as we get further along. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Other questions, observations? And, you know, don't think just about storytelling. Think about memoir. Um, I just taught a course down in Middlebury about memoir writing. And it was packed. And I, one of the assignments was everybody had to write a one-page memoir. And I have to tell you, I was thunderstruck by what some people had, you know, what they wrote and read and turned in. Um, so, you know, I mean, books are, there's cookbooks, there's travel books, there's um, personal experience, memoir, there's genre fiction, there's literary fiction. So you need to just think what's in your heart and your head and um, let it out. Anything else? Well, that was good. You've been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.